Hello, welcome to my video sample for my presentation on the topic of professional effectiveness. This is a general sort of broad uh, set of information and collection of tips and tricks that I've gathered to help you be a more effective professional. I'm going to include it in my career management professional development area and uh, it's a bit of a grab bag. Oftentimes when you hire a speaker or a keynote speaker or a motivational speaker, they have a very grandiose concept, you know, how to change three steps to success, how to change your life. But then you go to work the next day and, you know, they have something clever to say, like, uh, I don't believe in impossible, I believe in and possible. And then you go to work the next day at 8 a.m. and you're like, okay, how can I be and possible today? This presentation flips that equation. There is no grandiose, overarching three steps to easy success. Um, but it will be a laundry list of very actionable, uh, direct things that you can do at work. Uh, a lot of very valuable tips. Sometimes they'll seem a little mundane. They're not particularly high level, but they can be very useful tips, I think. So I brought a few examples here. Um, there are a lot of other ones that I love, uh, but I can't get them into a sample. So, but th they're talking about meetings, both ho attending and uh, hosting meetings, working in teams, uh, delivering, making and delivering presentations. But the ones that I'm going to give you today for the sample are, we're going to talk a little bit about communications. Um, and we're also going to talk a little bit about uh, a general idea of executive presence, sort of developing a, a persona, creating the impression of authority. And we're going to talk at the very end about just a miscellaneous grab bag, some examples from some of my other subjects. So let's get started on communications. You know, if you want to send a message to someone, there are a variety of ways you can do it now. You can do it in person, you can do it uh, voice, or you can leave a voice mail, or you can do it email, text, instant messaging. Uh, there's all sorts of ways to do it, social media as well, sort of along the lines of text and instant messaging. Um, the first thing I think it's important to remember when you do this is uh, you got to decide which is the right mechanism. The mistake we oftentimes make is we go to whichever one we prefer to send messages, but oftentimes the, the medium uh, should depend on the message that you're sending. For example, if you have a very sensitive topic to broach, it's usually more appropriate to do it in person or at least over the phone. You don't want to just text or instant message somebody an important message. An example of that is recently when Yahoo fired their CEO, they had uh, somebody from the board read them a script over the phone. And that's, uh, that was generally perceived in the business community as being a very poor choice. That's a message that should have been delivered in person. Um, another thing that you want to remember is sometimes when you make a call, you don't know if you're going to be doing a voice or a voice message. If you go, sometimes it'll go to the machine and there's a couple of things you should bear in mind. First of all, you should be prepared for either. Don't script a voice message and then end up getting, hey, hello, the person's right there, and vice versa. The other thing to remember is that if you start using voice messages, oftentimes, uh, if you're on your own system, you remember how to stop, delete, uh, re-record, and then all, you get used to that, and then all of a sudden you're calling someone outside of your system, and then you stop mid-message to delete and re-record, and then realize that you don't actually have that option or you don't know how to use their menu that way. So always remember, if, you're gonna, if you end up leaving a voice message, do you have the ability to re-record or not? Uh, is it internal or external? And um, if not, you want to rehearse a little bit better. Um, also, the uh, when you uh, when you want to send something uh, via the written mechanisms here, like email, text, instant messaging, uh, those are generally bad for dialogue. If there's going to be a lot of back and forth because you'll send them an email saying, what do you want to do? And then they'll say, I want to do this. And then you read them back, well, that means this. And they go, well, what about that? Uh, oftentimes, you can, if there's a lot of back and forth, you can fix that faster in person or with voice. You can just have the back and forth real time. That's especially important if you need a decision to go on further action because exchanging emails and texts several times will oftentimes uh, rec mean if there's a few hours between each response, you could go a couple of days. Also wanted to remind you that uh, you don't necessarily get to choose this yourself. Oftentimes if you're working with a client or a manager, a boss, uh, they might have a preference. And even if you think the, the message would be better in one medium versus another, you might have to defer to their preference. A few tips on written uh, messages, like especially emails, texts, even reports. 
oftentimes we get into the uh, habit of telling a story as a narrative like well first this happened then that happened then that happened and then it's finally at the end we get to the conclusion in business communications time is precious and there are a couple of other styles that i recommend you use um, one of them is what's called the newspaper style. If you read a newspaper article, they give you the general story within the first paragraph and then the, it gets more and more detailed as you go along. And the reason for that, but, but you can actually just stop at the begin first paragraph and get most of the story. The reason for that is because not everybody reads a complete newspaper article. They might read just the first few paragraphs to get uh, the general idea and skip the detail because if it's, a, if it's a long article, they might not have the time or be that interested in the topic. So doing it in that style, uh, full message summary, then slightly more detailed version, then slightly more detailed version, allows the user to decide, uh, the recipient of your message to decide um, how much uh, detail they choose to go into. There's another um, me mechanism you can use for long uh, written, written stories, uh, messages. Oftentimes, if it's, if it's long, you don't want them to wait till the end to get the story. So you give them an introduction that says, here's the main point. Then you give them a body that gives them the detail. And oftentimes, you'll even give them a conclusion that reinforces that same main point. So that's for particularly long things like uh, reports and whatnot. So uh, whenever I do something written, when I get done, even if it's even an email or a text, sometimes I'll stop and reread it with the specific intent of taking words out. One of the mistakes we make is we just write it and then send it and we don't reread, we don't proofread it if it's an email or a text because it's so short. And oftentimes we either have things that aren't clear in there and we can write better, we'll figure out a better way to do it the second time we look at it. And we can oftentimes realize that there's words and prefaces that aren't really necessary. We usually don't text message those, but emails for typing quickly we can have ancillary words and you can really tighten it up if you take that second pass. In terms of speaking, spoken messages, um, one thing that I think it's advisable to do is to uh, outline and practice uh, before you send to your audience. And that's for the same reason as we just talked about with written. If you practice it a couple of times, you'll start to realize what's, uh, what's you get, what starts you to, pardon me, well, I'm illustrating this myself. You learn what things you stumble on and you learn to tighten it up. You also learn where you have extra words and, and ancillary things and you can pull them out. Uh, also, you, we tend to neglect very much the use of silence. There's a couple of important points that you can get with silence. One of them is you can pause and allow someone to soak in a message. And so if you're giving an important point, you might stop and leave a pause afterwards to allow to illustrate the fact that that's a particularly important point. Also, if someone is speaking to you, you can stop and be silent and they will oftentimes fill that gap because people are uncomfortable with silence. So if you if they're saying, and so that's what I think we should do and you just and, and wait, they'll be because and then they'll give you more elaboration. So if you want them to elaborate, that's a trick you can use to get them to do so. And the last one I want to give an example of uh, it's sort of a variation on the written thing, sort of when you're doing a quick email or a text, or it, it's important to remember that tone is a very important part of communication and it doesn't come through in written words. And we're especially sloppy with emails and texts. So I use my example here. I'll, I'll use the phrase, I think that. And there are, it, it seems self-evident, but there are actually a variety of meanings based on tone. And I'll illustrate that here. If you say, I think that, it means I believe this to be true. If you say, I think that, it implies that I think this is true, but others might not. If you say, I think that, it means I suspect this is true, but I'm not sure. And if you say, I think that, it means there are other things that I think are untrue that you haven't asked me about. So there's uh, four variations right there for just a simple three word sentence. And that will not come through in emails and texts. Um, and likewise, uh, the, the same thing could be said if it was a question, I think that, or I think that, or I think that. And uh, oftentimes the question mark would illustrate that, but because in some phones, if you're texting, you gotta go to a different menu for a question mark, so some people just don't bother and they just leave it as a sentence and that can cause serious confusion. Also, sarcasm doesn't always come across well. That's why we've invented the LOL to indicate you're saying something that's joking. Those are some communication, quick communications, Tricks. Now let's go to uh, executive presence. This is about um, this is to help people 
create a perception of authority and it's a bit of a, a bit of a mind game but it, it actually can have a dramatic impact sometimes people who have a, a certain amount of competence fail to get the promotions that they deserve because they they just aren't perceived as being an authority figure and, and, and the attempt here is to resolve that one of them I always say is posture is a panacea it makes you look more professional it makes you look taller which which is a fit in, in studies have shown that Taller people tend to be uh, more senior in organizations. And so work on your posture. My mother always said, you should think of yourself as being suspended from strings behind your ears because it will get your back straight and your nose down. And it's always fun to uh, uh, give this presentation because you can see the audience. Everybody sits up a little straighter when you get to this. I, I myself stand up a little straighter if you want to rewind and catch me doing that. Also, um, dress and formality. If you look at the way we dress, right now a lot of organizations are business casual, but it's important to note that even business casual has a lot of flexibility. If you're wearing, you know, sort of the knit shirts with the wrinkled co the collars that kind of turn up versus the pressed shirts, both of those can be uh, both of those can be appropriate for business casual. But it's important to, I, I usually recommend if you want to have an executive presence, you're slightly more formal than average for the given circumstance. I always say, uh, uh, I like to look like someone who's, uh, who, who, who does it, who's un slightly uncomfortable dressing down. So I look like I just took my jacket and tie off, but you can tell that my shirt is still pressed and I still sort of, and I'm still wearing nice shoes. I, I look like I don't quite, I'm un slightly uncomfortable with business casual. Another thing that you'll notice executives tend to do is they're oftentimes not, they're, they're, they're usually not in a hurry. And the reason is they don't answer to the world, the world answers to them. They don't wait on the world, the world waits on them. And so you'll, if you have someone who always tries to cram in something to say, and you don't find executives doing a lot of that. Even when they walk, they're rarely, uh, they, they rock with maybe determination or authority, but there's, there's, a, there's a confidence to it. They don't uh, uh, move around and sway around things. Oftentimes they'll walk a little slower, in fact. And some of this comes down to yielding, like in a hallway. You'll notice that people with authority uh, uh, will oftentimes wait for others to get out of their way. You will never see the President of the United States try and squeeze through a couple of people or behind a chair. That he will say, pardon me, and they will separate, and then he will proceed. And, and there's a lot of uh, tricks like that to executive presence. I think that, uh, that it's hard to be taken seriously when you're trying to squeeze your way through something. Also, the, uh, when talking a little bit about your interactions, typically when someone ans asks you a question, the impulse is to answer it. But if the question is uncomfortable, you'll notice that more senior people oftentimes either ignore the fact that it was answered outright or might change the subject or they might uh, answer the question that they wanted them to ask, not literally the question that they did ask. Politicians are the masters of this. They will always say, uh, uh, you know, you might say, "Is it? Do you do you do you support incre uh, increasing spending on subsidies for the oil and gas industry?" And they'll say, "I think it's important that we have our own natural resources used in this country." Not exactly the answer to the question. They answer the question the way they wished it had been asked, not the way it was. And if you like things like that, or the uh, um, some of these other things like using silence when you're speaking with others. I have another presentation I'd recommend just on uh, navigating personal interactions. And the last thing I have on executive presence is you'll notice executives don't use a lot of ums, ers, they don't use a lot of filler words. First of all, it makes them sound uncomfortable, like they're trying to uh, keep you keep your attention even though and which implies that they're afraid of losing it which implies that they don't have the authority to command it and this sort of gets back to uh, the rush you know the, they want the world to wait on what they have to say they don't push the world to listen to them also phrases like like so he's like what are we going to do about this that's very casual the same thing about using the word goes instead of said so you wouldn't say uh, an executive won't so say and she goes what am I going to do about this they would say she said she would did not know what to do and likewise you know is like a request for validation and if you're an authority figure you don't need someone's validation so there's are some tricks on executive presence the last one's kind of a smorgasbord here um, first of all it's always helpful to remember names that's an important skill to develop and I have a few tricks to help you do that 
The first one is when you meet someone, maybe shaking their hand, you repeat their names. They say, hi, this, hi, hi, I'm Matt. I say, oh, Matt, it's nice to meet you. That re-impresses the brain. Now you've got twice as much, you've heard it now twice because they said it and you've said it, so you're twice as likely to remember. Also, it's important to, uh, or one, one possibility is to remember someone else you know named Matt. And just the fact that your mind relates it to someone else that you know, the next time you meet them, the picture of that person will appear and the name will come to you. Uh, it's surprising how well that works. And the last one is if you forget someone's name, this is a little trick that it almost sounds unbelievable, but it works enough to be worth its while. You say the ABCs in your head. You say A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I. And when you get to the letter that their name begins with, the name will come to you. Try it. It's, it, it sounds a little counterintuitive, but it works pretty well. I used to be able to drink for free because I got so good at remembering names because I had a friend of mine who was a very good looking guy and the girls always wanted to talk to him, but after a couple of drinks, he'd forget their names. So he would say, hey, do you remember her name? And I'll say, buy me a beer and I'll tell you. So that, that, this can be beneficial, not just for yourself, but for your peers. Um, another trick is, uh, another important thing to remember in terms of your professional effectiveness is the development of relationships. I don't mean this just in terms of, or I don't mean this in terms of like your romantic relationships, or your family relationships, I mean professional. And there are a couple of tricks you need to remember. One of them is, you, it's best if you develop your relationships before you need to ask these people to do something for you, to work with you. And that way it seems more sincere, more genuine. If you only introduce yourself the day you need something, they don't know how serious you take, how, how seriously you value them uh, beyond just the literal task at hand. Um, another trick for that is it's important to develop the relationships and, and, and keep them going even when you don't need something. So example, you want to call them, stop by their desk, ha go out and have a beer with them, even when you don't need anything, because that way they're, they're oftentimes more happy to see you. If you only talk to them when you need something from you, every time the phone rings, maybe the voice, the, the ID picks up, they know it's you, they're like, oh, this guy probably wants something. So you want to you wanna make sure that they have reason to want to talk to you beyond just uh, placing a burden or giving more work to them. Another trick to remember is that notes oftentimes make people uncomfortable if you take a lot of notes. This is my problem because I'm a little obsessive like that. I like to take notes. It helps me, but I have to stop myself from doing so because when you're talking to someone else and they see you're always taking notes, they assume that you're trying to put them on the record so you can capture them later. And, and uh, the documentation generally makes people a little bit more hesitant to be candid with you. So mind your notes. Also, the importance of first impression. Everybody knows that first impressions are important, but I want to add a couple of facts, my own two cents here, if you will, uh, literally two. Um, the first one I want to say is typically people draw a first impression from you the first two seconds they see you. It's really that quick. And so that's how important things like posture and executive presence can be and remembering names. Another thing to remember is that uh, once they have a first impression, they're subject to what's called confirmation bias, which means even if the first impression was bad, you got off on the wrong foot, from now on, they're not necessarily gonna change that opinion. If they see something that confirms their opinion of you, they will take it at face value and say that that defines you. If they see something that is different than their first impression, they actually kind of dismiss it because they're still stuck on that first impression. That's a confirmation bias. We seek information that confirms what we already believe and we diminish information that shows us, uh, that, that, that undermines what we already believe. There's a certain sort of psycho-egotistical element there. So if you get off on the wrong foot, even if you do a better job later, you might not be able to change it. And the last one I wanna point out is that the most important thing, the most revealing thing about us as people is our eyes the way we look at people and the way we act with our eyes. But the problem with that is we almost never know how our eyes are. We can see our hands and our dress, um, but we can never see our eyes unless of course we're looking in a mirror, which we're not doing when we're usually meeting people. So you've got to remember what you do with your eyes when you meet someone. Most important, look them in the eye. Uh, men were particularly prone to uh, look women up and down when we meet them. That's a terrible habit. You must stop yourself from breaking that. Uh, if you, there's a woman uh, that you know, ask, ask her. She will tell you numerous stories of, of guys who did that and got off on the wrong foot with her.
And the last one I want to give you is just a business travel tip. Uh, I could probably do a whole hour just on business travel, as could a lot of, frankly, people who travel for business. But this is one of my favorites. I'm notorious for getting my key card, uh, checking into the hotel, going to my meeting, going out for dinner afterwards, going out for drinks after that, coming in relatively late and forgetting what my room number is. So that in, now that the card, magnetic cards are interchangeable, they don't print it on there, you can, uh, the best thing you can do is put it in your phone when you get there. This is also true for your parking floor. I live in Las Vegas, everybody's got a 20 story parking garage here and you go into the casino and you come out three hours, $500, poor and with a couple more drinks in you and you easily forget where your car is and it takes forever walking the parking lot to find it. So you put that in your phone. I do that when I get on the elevator in a parking garage. The reason is because you know sometimes there's the parking garages are an angle as they go up between one level to the other. So did I go to the fourth floor elevator or the fifth? Look at the number on the elevator and put it in your phone. So those are a bunch of just basically a list of things that I think can be very actionable, very helpful. No overarching uh, comprehensive vision there. Just a, just a, a list of a lot of helpful tips for professional effectiveness. If you like something like this and you'd like to see it presented, please contact me at keithwhite.com for a proposal. I look forward to doing business with you. Thank you.